What is up? Good mic work. Back at you. Here we go. Night number one of our two big nights in wrestling is in the books. Monday Night Raw just concluded. Huge setup to tomorrow night's draft, and of course this was technically the go-home battleground show as well. So there was a lot going on. We had a WWE title match in the main event tonight of Raw, and both general managers for Raw and SmackDown were to be announced. There was really a ton of shit going on tonight, and I'm going to talk about all of it. What you can expect to hear in this episode is a brief rundown of Monday Night Raw. My opinions on WWE's choices for the two general managers, my thoughts on the WWE title match. I'll get into the latest on Brock Lesnar, preview Battleground a little bit, and I will also give you a big preview to tomorrow night's WWE draft. Now, I did not come up here and do any sort of a mock draft, so what you're going to get tonight is going to be the closest thing to that. I have basically jotted down a handful of wrestlers for each show and where I think they might go and why, and I'll give that to you. It's not a full-on roster draft, but a lot of the big names and some of the more significant talent I have placed on shows where I think they should be, and I'll get into all that a little bit later on after we talk about Raw. First thing we'll talk about is the general managers, because Raw did open with that. It was announced on WWE's Twitter page and the Raw pre-show and all over social media that that would open up the show. Shane and Stephanie would announce their general managers. Stephanie comes out first before she can even open up her mouth. Shane comes out and interrupts. The two of them cut a promo on each other, and Stephanie is the one to announce her GM first. Now, to me, SmackDown was sort of spoiled a little bit. We kind of had a feeling who it was going to be there, but Raw was kind of up in the air. And I said from day one, when they first announced that each show was going to have a general manager that whoever it is cannot just be some random name thrown out there that the WWE just says, okay, fuck it, let's go with him, and it really doesn't feel like it can be long-term. And uh, with Stephanie's choice tonight, that seems very, very clear that the WWE does not have any long-term plans. Stephanie's choice for GM of Raw was none other than Mick Foley, a former commissioner of Monday Night Raw back in the day, so certainly I guess he would be qualified, and it's always great to see Mick Foley out on TV. He's one of my favorite personalities in the history of the pro wrestling business, so I would never complain about seeing Mick on TV, but the choice seems odd for Stephanie's character. Does she not know who she fucks every night? What's that guy's name again? Triple something or Hunter something? T- Tara Ryzen, that's it. That's his name. But her husband seems like the perfect guy for her to pick to run Raw because, number one, he's got a big position in the company. Number two, he's done it before. And number three, he's her husband. And number four, the two of them have run Raw before during the authority days. So who else would be the only pick there? How can she possibly select anybody else? So now you're wondering why did Stephanie's character pick Mick Foley? I think they could run a story where Stephanie is just trying to manipulate the fans. She figures she better put a baby face in charge of Monday Night Raw so Raw doesn't turn out to be the heel and SmackDown turns out to be the baby face. She wants the fans to like who the person in charge is and she can pull all the strings from behind the scenes. And I hate this idea of the GMs anyway because as we saw tonight, everybody is out there with each other. So every week Mick Foley is going to be in charge of Raw, but not really because Stephanie is going to be out there with him the whole time. There's going to be friction between the two of them. It's going to lead to issues and storyline crap and all of that. So Mick Foley doesn't even get to have full control of Monday Night Raw because Stephanie is going to be breathing down his neck the whole fucking time and she's going to be on camera just as much as he is. So if you ask me, this whole thing is kind of stupid and they should just do one person and one person in charge because now you got Mick Foley in charge of Raw but he really answers to Stephanie and of course Daniel Bryan is in charge of SmackDown and he's going to answer to Shane McMahon and then all of them have to answer to Vince McMahon. So it's too big of a chain of command. I think one person should should be in charge of each show, period, and they shouldn't have to ask permission from anybody else to make any decision on Raw or SmackDown. So having a commissioner and a GM is confusing. I think last week I was talking about Shane and Stephanie being the GM and they have to hire commissioners, but it's actually the other way around. So it was confusing the hell out of me as it was. And with what we saw tonight on Raw, with all these bodies out there and all these people in charge... It just kind of seems clusterfucky, but in in the meantime, I'm happy to see Mick Foley. He's awesome. He's a great promo. He's definitely fan-friendly, and I think in the short term, he can come out there and make some really fan-friendly decisions, but you gotta know that there's no way this can go on forever, which is what I don't like.
like because this brand split is supposed to be a big deal. It's supposed to be the future of the WWE. And I think they should have put a little bit more time and effort into deciding who the GMs are and whoever they chose. The first ones for each show, I think, need to be somewhat permanent. I know nothing can last forever. You can't have a GM be in charge for years at a time, although I think Eric Bischoff had control for a few years there. But at least have somebody be in charge for close to a year. This Mick Foley shit seems like it could end as early as SummerSlam, and eventually you know Triple H has got to get back into the mix. I can almost sense that eventually he might take over as the new GM of Raw, even though Vince, I think, said all decisions are final. You know they can always work something out there. I can almost smell a match between Triple H and an opponent of Mick Foley's choosing for control of Raw. Maybe that could take place at SummerSlam, and if Triple H wins, he becomes the new GM of Raw. So I can see this ending for Mick Foley badly sometime in the future, and I have a really strong feeling he's going to eat a pedigree at some point. Stephanie, no doubt, will slap him one week on Raw, which is really going to irk me and a lot of other wrestling fans when she does that to people, especially someone like Mick Foley, who we all love. So I'm just a little bit split on the decision. While I don't want to complain about seeing Mick Foley on TV, the choice to me seems strange, and I don't have a whole lot of confidence in the longevity of that storyline. On the other side of things, on SmackDown, I can see that being a little bit more permanent. Shane is a babyface. He hired Daniel Bryan as the babyface GM. The two of them should get along just fine. I see very few... Uh, opportunities for conflict there. Shane will probably let Daniel Bryan do, for the most part, what he wants. The fans, of course, love him. He got an enormous pop tonight on Monday Night Raw, and it was pretty much leaked that he was going to be the guy that was going to be in charge of SmackDown, so we really weren't surprised about the announcement of Daniel Bryan, but it sure was good to see him out there. And I'll tell you what, the two GMs, when you look at them, Mick Foley's wearing sweatpants and flannel, and Daniel Bryan looks like a a hippie college English professor or a substitute teacher or something like that. So not the two best-dressed WWE commissioners we've ever had. And I even like the exchange the two of them had uh, later on in the show in the back, where they showed some respect for each other, but they talked a little bit of smack, too. And Mick Foley talked about how much they had in common, like their love for flannel, their love for beards, and scoring wives that are out of their league. I thought that was kind of funny. But he also said uh, competition is going to be fierce, and they are out uh, to destroy each other. So all I can do is hope for the best between these two. Daniel Bryan, I think, is a little bit more permanent than Mick Foley. And Dee Bry should do a great job running SmackDown. And later on, when I get into who is going to be drafted to what show, who the commissioner is you know, can play a big role of who's going to go where. It's hard to do a mock draft before you know who's going to be in charge because you have to take their characters into consideration and who you think they would draft. And now that we know who's in charge, I got some pretty good ideas where guys might wind up. So really, for the most part, I guess I am happy about the GM choices. I just think uh, the Foley one is a little strange, that's all. But I wish both of these guys nothing but the best. I hope WWE can use these guys in a way where they're not humiliated at the feet of the McMahons and they can actually go out there and make some kayfabe decisions and run their shows in an exciting way. And tomorrow night on WWE SmackDown Live, the very first live show in the WWE Draft can be the beginning of all of that. So stay tuned later on when I get into the draft. The other big angle that took place tonight on WWE Raw, of course, was the WWE title on the line. Championship match in the main event. Dean Ambrose defending against Seth Rollins. A lot of us were smelling a title change here. I thought it would be a great idea to have Seth Rollins go into Battleground as WWE Champion. Really building up this brand split and building up how big these two days can be for professional wrestling if both of these shows turn out to be blockbusters. And the main event was, uh, I don't know what to make of it. First of all, you had everybody on the outside of the ring. 75 people were on the outside of the ring. All the announcers, the Spanish guys, you had Shane, you had Stephanie, you had Daniel Bryan, you had Mick Foley. They're all there to watch this match. So you knew something was going to end all fucked up. Both guys also cut really awesome promos. Before the match, Seth Rollins had a great empty arena promo where he kind of walked down through the seats the way the Shield always did, cutting a very quiet and slow promo the whole time, with it ending with him standing on the barricade and declaring that he was the best. Later on, Dean Ambrose also paid tribute to the Shield and did an old school, like, shaky camera, poor video quality promo on Seth Rollins that was significantly shorter than Seth's promo. I thought it was a great setup for the match, and I was excited for the match. And I was kind of hoping for a title change, but we might have gotten it, At the very end there, they went with a double pin. A lot of near falls in this thing. Both guys kicked out of each other's finishers. Dean Ambrose kicked out of a pedigree that I thought for sure was the end of the match. And Seth Rollins also uh, put his foot on the rope and survived the dirty deeds. And then the match ends with uh, both guys kind of putting each other in a small package and the referee counting all four shoulders down. 
and nobody knows what the hell's going on. Everybody gets in the ring, Foley and Daniel Bryan and Stephanie and Shane. See what I mean? I mean, who's in charge here, really? Is there going to be a McMahon attached to the ass of these commissioners on every show? That's going to get so annoying. Finally, Stephanie just rolls out of the ring, grabs the mic, and declares that Seth Rollins is the brand new WWE champion. He takes the belt, his music plays, and the show goes off the air. So you're like, holy shit, cliffhanger. Who the hell is the WWE champion? Who the hell won this match? We don't know. Luckily, immediately following Raw on the WWE, WWE Network, the referee did rule that Dean Ambrose is still the WWE champion, which is obvious because technically the match was a tie. And in that situation, there's not going to be a title change. Ambrose is going to remain champion, and that's that. I thought maybe they would wait until tomorrow night to let us know who the WWE champion is, or maybe they would even do something crazy like vacate the title and the winner of the triple threat match at Battleground gets it. I was really hoping they didn't do that. So I'm happy to see that, you know, they left us with a cliffhanger, but they also let us know right away that, don't worry, Dean Ambrose is still the WWE champion. So I guess I'm fine with that. All in all, tonight was a pretty good Monday Night Raw. I gave some shit last week to the Providence, Rhode Island crowd, only because, for some reason in my head, the last time I remember a Raw being there, I remember the crowd being shitty. And I mentioned that, and I think people mistook that for me thinking that, Every crowd in Providence is going to suck, and everybody there just sucks a big pile of dicks. That's not really what I meant or said. I was just uh, disappointed that the title match didn't happen last week because Detroit was so hot, and I was nervous that Providence would not be as hot. But they were. The crowd was great tonight. Good job to the fans there for showing up to this show and not having their thumbs up their asses. One of the downfalls of this Monday Night Raw is it was just loaded with tag team matches. It was very lazy booking by WWE. Because they have so much other stuff going on with the WWE draft tomorrow night, a title match, and new GMs, and all this stuff. They probably didn't have a whole lot of time to think through a lot of the undercard stuff and build these matches for Battleground. This is the go-home show, so basically anybody that is involved in a Battleground match on Sunday was involved in a tag team match tonight, including a big 12-man tag. Big clusterfuck match between John Cena, Enzo, and Cass, and the New Day versus the club and the Wyatt family, which I already don't like seeing the Wyatt family in environments like this me they need to be a loner group just the three of them you know they don't get along with anybody heel or babyface outside of their own family I don't think they should be teaming up with anybody and definitely not in a major match like this the club and the Wyatt family did win that match incidentally when AJ Styles hit Enzo with the Styles clash so you got those two big matches taking place at Battleground and uh, I think WWE has really big plans for Cass as well. It was really awesome to see that stare down with him and Braun Strowman. That got a lot of holy shit chants from the crowd, I think, as well. And that was a huge matchup, and Cass is fucking awesome. And uh, maybe it's time to split up Enzo and Cass. I know it's early. I know they just got there, but how much longer can they do this shtick and the soft and all that shit when uh, Cass is a star ready to launch right there? He's very reminiscent of Edge. Kind of looks like him a little bit. I think uh, when he breaks out on his own one day, he could have a similar gimmick. I think he's going to get better and better on the mic as he goes along. And if they wanted to do something like have Enzo and Cass turn on John Cena, or maybe Cass turns on Enzo, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if the club gets another victory. Because if these two guys, Cena and AJ, that is, work SummerSlam, I'm starting to think Cena is going to get his victory. Tag team matches just out the ass tonight. We also had Sami Zayn and Cesaro teaming up to face Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens. Zayn and Cesaro get the victory when Zayn rolls up Chris Jericho for the pin. Chris Jericho is one of my favorite people in WWE right now. I hope he sticks around for a little bit longer. He's a shell of what he used to be in the ring, but his character seems to be like, I don't know, like reborn, you know, kind of how he went through that transformation in 2008. It seems like he's undergoing another one of those just little miniature hot streaks where he gets really good for a while, and I just love everything Chris Jericho says and does, and I hope he sticks around for at least a little while because there's not going to be too many years left where we're going to get Chris Jericho as an active wrestler. We also got Zack Ryder and Dolph Ziggler taking on Sheamus and Rusev. Lana came out to introduce Rusev. She was wearing this hot little camouflage outfit. That was pretty great. Uh, Ziggler taps out to the accolade. Got virtually no reaction from the crowd either, so really sad to see what has become of Dolph Ziggler, but Rusev keeps on rolling, and I see no reason for him to drop that belt to Zack Ryder. Sasha and Becky teamed up to face Charlotte and Dana Brooke in a tag team match. Natalia showed up and attacked Becky Lynch again, so Natalia is still after Becky and full-blown heel now. Charlotte and Dana then beat the hell out of Sasha Banks to close out that segment, and of course, the big match at Battleground is a tag team match, Charlotte and Dana versus Sasha and a Miss partner. To me, this has Bailey written all over it. I don't know who else it could possibly be. Asuka is currently doing her thing as the women's champ, and Nia Jax I don't think would be ready yet, although they could bring her up. 
So I think uh, Bailey is the most logical choice because Sasha is so well loved, and Bailey, of course, is too. She would be the perfect person to be the mystery partner, and that could be the way they launch her onto the main roster. A little lazy, but that's what the WWE does. I do, however, like that they're going with the tag team match at Battleground, and they're not rushing things. I think Sasha, when she finally does defeat Charlotte, I think Sasha will be the person to finally and Charlotte's streak, and that could be a good match to take place at SummerSlam, depending on where that falls in Charlotte's title reign. If the WWE wants to have her break Nikki's record, yes, I know, then Divas title doesn't exist anymore, but this is still one long title reign for Charlotte. It's not her fault they changed the belt in the middle of it. She has still held that thing for a long time, so they might want to hold out and have her be the new longest reigning women's champion ever, or uh, have her drop it at SummerSlam, but uh, SummerSlam in New York with Sasha winning in that building on that stage seems like the perfect place for Charlotte to finally cough up the women's title. Nothing else significant really happened on Monday Night Raw. I guess we did finally get the debut, the real actual debut of Darren Young and Bob Backlund. He took on Alberto Del Rio while The Miz did commentary and talked about him a little bit. Ended up beating Del Rio with a roll-up, and that's going to be your Intercontinental title match at Battleground, The Miz versus Darren Young. And I think given the election and kind of the spoof on that with the Make Darren Great Again shit, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they just put the belt on him, which I'm not a huge fan of because I like Darren Young. I want him to succeed. I think this storyline going on with Bob Backlund can be mildly entertaining, but just to throw a belt on him, just to help get him over or whatever, I don't like it when they do that with the Intercontinental title. So this is one of the rare instances where I would be completely fine with The Miz hanging on to it one more pay-per-view, but it just kind of reeks of one of those things that uh, WWE is going to do, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if uh, Darren Young is the new IC champ in a few days. So that'll pretty much wrap it up for Monday Night Raw. I'll talk a little bit about Brock Lesnar and the draft here in a second, but don't forget to join me live on Twitter tomorrow night. I will be home for the WWE draft on the first live SmackDown, giving all my thoughts during the show, and I will be up here a few hours after it goes off the air with my reaction to the draft, where everybody ended up, and some battleground predictions as well. Uh, Before we get into that draft and some of my mock picks for that, I just want to touch on the Brock Lesnar situation. WWE promoted the hell out of SummerSlam tonight, so it's a done deal. Whatever happened with Brock Lesnar is not going to affect his SummerSlam match. That is still a go. They talked about it. They promoted Randy Orton's appearance on the highlight reel at Battleground and did a small little video package on the whole thing as well. So they're not hiding away from this. And I have a feeling at Battleground, Jericho and Randy Orton, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they touched on what's going on with Brock Lesnar because WWE did the right thing and mentioned it with Roman Reigns and didn't try to ignore it. The fact that the entire world knows what's going on in WWE to pretend that it doesn't exist is stupid in this day and age, and they knew that with Roman Reigns. So hopefully, maybe without getting into too much detail, they will at least acknowledge. Maybe Jericho's like, you know, all the I'm sure you're reading all the reports with Brock Lesnar. Does this make you nervous to get into the ring with a guy like this that's so controversial? And Randy Orton can be like, I don't give a shit what's going on with him. I want this match. I want to fight him. I don't care what he does or what kind of drugs he takes. I want to beat the beast. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if they made some sort of a mention to the controversy surrounding Brock Lesnar. As far as any new information goes, the only new stuff we've heard is there are reports coming out that this could have been something related to an inhaler that he was prescribed for respiratory breathing problems and issues and a a condition that he's had his whole life. And I've even said from the minute that this story was announced that Brock Lesnar does not come off as, as one of those people that is really stupid to risk so much just for a tiny bit of an edge to take a banned substance that you really don't need to take to begin with. Is it really worth it to do that? And that's why I was pretty much convinced that Brock had to have unknowingly taken something or his training staff, who should be able to monitor this stuff and should be able to know when they give Brock something, make sure that it's not banned. It could be anybody's fault. So the fact that the WWE is promoting this match as planned at SummerSlam, I have a feeling maybe Brock called Vince and said, look, Vince, I swear to you, this was nothing intentional. I got to look into it, but here is what happened. Brock, I'm sure, knows what happened or knows what he took, and he probably told Vince that. I'm sorry for the problems that this has caused, and I didn't intentionally do this, and I definitely didn't take any anabolic steroids or anything like that. This this was uh, could have been anything. People have even been talking about that there are banned training methods, not just substances, just methods of training that are banned. So we don't even really know at this point what exactly it was, but it was just some sort of a, a supplement of some kind or some sort of a chemical or something that was in something that he took or inhaled, possibly, that happened to be on the ban list, and it doesn't look like it was something where he was intentionally cheating. We don't know that for sure. He might have been, but I find that extremely hard to believe. So hopefully in the days and weeks, the worst case scenario is that yes, this stuff was in Brock Lesnar's system, but it wasn't intended 
And given Brock's track record and the fact that he's been clean throughout his life and he took many drug tests leading up to this fight at UFC, this is just one that came back as a potential violation. They keep, they still keep calling it a potential violation. So I guess still there's a lot of things up in the air. But I'm still disappointed as hell about it because it just tarnishes everything. And whether Brock did this on purpose or not, it could have been completely innocent and it sounds like it was. To me, it's like it's too late now. He's branded as a performance-enhancing drug user. And unless the true story comes out to be extremely minor and the media forgives him, and maybe he's not suspended by the Nevada State Athletic Commission and his UFC career is not over, hopefully Brock can move on with this and his reputation is not ruined. But that still remains to be seen. But for right now, the match with Randy Orton is on at SummerSlam, which I'm happy about. We got over a month for this thing to maybe blow over, and uh, we'll see how the buildup goes for this show over the next few weeks. Unfortunately, this violation looks like it has costed Brock the opportunity to be on SmackDown. I think he was originally scheduled to be on SmackDown for the draft, but WWE probably doesn't want him there because of all the controversy surrounding him. So it looks like they're probably going to keep him off of the show, but they will still draft him, I'm sure. So with that being said, let me just briefly get into the WWE draft and where I think guys might wind up. And I did this very quickly. I didn't spend hours analyzing or thinking about this. This is just my gut feeling where I think guys should be placed. Feel free to agree or disagree with me or whatever. I really don't care. This is just what I came up with in my head. Now, as far as Monday Night Raw goes, you got to think about who's in charge. Stephanie, who's underneath her? Mick Foley. Who do we see Stephanie appear to be the biggest fan of tonight on Monday Night Raw? Seth Rollins. And given what has happened to Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar in recent weeks, I think that Seth Rollins is the most deserving guy on the WWE roster right now to be drafted number one. So I believe that Stephanie not only will draft Rollins to Raw, but he will go number one. And she's probably going to do that tomorrow night with the confidence in him that he's going to go into battleground and bring the WWE title back to Monday Night Raw. Which brings me to Dean Ambrose. I have a feeling that Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan are going to draft Dean Ambrose because they're going to be confident that he's going to go into battleground and retain the WWE title and bring the WWE title to SmackDown. So both Shane and Stephanie, I believe, are going to think that they are going to have the WWE title holder, which one of my biggest complaints about this draft so far is they have not announced shit about the titles. What's going to happen with the world title? Are they going to have a new SmackDown title? Is the world heavyweight title going to be brought back? What the hell are they going to do with the women? Is the women's division going to be exclusive to one show and one show only? Or are there going to be women drafted to both shows and the champion defends the title against opponents from both shows? That's what I have a feeling might happen because it has to be that way. Either that or you make a second women's title and I really don't want them to do that. Obviously, the Intercontinental and United States title hopefully will be separated, and the tag team situation is the same as the women. Does one show get that division exclusively? I think the SmackDown brand should get the tag team division, because one thing I failed to mention when I was talking about Raw is Stephanie dropped a bombshell in her promo, and that is that the Cruiserweight division will be returning to WWE, and the Cruiserweight title will be returning to WWE, and that will be exclusive to the Raw brand, which makes a lot of sense, because Raw is three hours, you got to fill that time somehow, and having good, exciting cruiserweight matches during the undercard is perfect for Monday Night Raw. So I am all aboard that decision by the WWE. It's long overdue for them to bring back the cruiserweight title. And given everything we're watching right now with the cruiserweight classic on the WWE Network, there's a lot of guys coming out of that tournament that can get jobs now, and I think that's awesome. So the cruiserweight title coming to Monday Night Raw exclusively is great. So I think the tag belts should go to SmackDown. We've also got a whole bunch of rules for the draft as well. Number one is that Raw will get the first pick, of course. Like I mentioned, Stephanie, I believe, will pick Seth Rollins. Also, since Raw is three hours long and SmackDown is two, for every two picks that SmackDown gets, Raw gets three. And then there's even a tag team stipulation in there is that tag teams will be counted as one pick unless the person in charge wants only one member of that team. So you got to know that they wouldn't put that rule in there if they didn't intend on breaking some tag teams up. One of those tag teams for sure is the Lucha Dragons because they already announced that they will be breaking up and going their separate ways and pursuing singles careers. So probably each show will get one of them. Or they could stay on the same show and uh, battle for the Cruiserweight title, I suppose, Kalisto and uh, Sin Cara. But it seems like they should be split up. Another team that I think should be split up or could be split up is the Dudley Boys. I want to see, for some reason, I just want to see one final run by Bubba Ray Dudley and I want to see him get a singles push similar to how he did in TNA, where he's just a badass shit-talking bully. And I've always wanted to see 
a Bully Ray versus Kevin Owens feud. I just think that would be a lot of fun, especially on the mic. The matches might not be half bad either. So I'm kind of hoping, since the Dudley Boys really haven't done anything since they came back, that maybe they split them up. It's failed every time they've split the Dudley Boys up in the past. Nobody liked or has any fond memories of Reverend Devon or anything like that. So, you know, Devon could be a casualty, and I hate that for him, but something tells me they should just split those guys up. The New Day is another possibility. I thought it would be funny if Stephanie, just a fuck with Xavier Woods, drafted the entire Wyatt family, but then only drafted Xavier Woods from the New Day, and he's going to be on one show all by himself with all those Wyatt family members. I think that would be a pretty fun angle to do. For right now, I kind of see the New Day staying together. But back to who I think will be on Monday Night Raw. Like I said, Rollins should be the first pick. It makes the most sense. I also think they should pick Roman Reigns. I think Roman Reigns should stay on Raw with Seth Rollins. I see Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt family possibly being there. Or maybe just Bray Wyatt. The Wyatt family is another faction that could be divided up. Maybe Bray goes to Raw and Rowan and Strowman go to SmackDown to potentially compete in the tag team division. I think the New Day is a good act for Monday Night Raw, and I think they should stay on Monday Night Raw as well. I think Randy Orton will be drafted to Raw. I think Charlotte will be drafted to Raw. Sasha Banks, Baron Corbin, The Miz, Enzo and Cass, Cesaro, Jericho, Sheamus, and Kane. Those are the guys I think should be on Monday Night Raw. And speaking of Kane, another guy I think should be on Monday Night Raw is The Undertaker. They are including The Undertaker in the draft. And given Mick Foley's history with the Brothers of Destruction, I can easily see him drafting both guys to Monday Night Raw. And since both of them are so old now, and they could literally retire at any time, if they got to interact a couple of more final times together before their careers are over, I think that would be really nice, and I think they should remain on the same show. So those are some of the big names I have penciled in for Monday Night Raw, and I know that's leaving out a lot. Did I mention Sami Zayn? I don't know if I did, but if I didn't, uh, Zayn, I think, will be on Monday Night Raw as well. As far as SmackDown goes, Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan. Obviously, I think their number one pick will probably be either Dean Ambrose, because I think Stephanie's going to pick Seth Rollins, so I think they have to pick Dean Ambrose, hoping that he retains the WWE title at Battleground, forcing Raw to create their own title. But I think it's going to go the other way around. I think the title's going back to Raw, and SmackDown is going to have to make a new belt and hopefully bring back the World Heavyweight title. With that being said, they need to crown a champion at some point. And this is possible. It could be Raw as well. I mean, the WWE title could very well come over to SmackDown. I just personally don't see it happening. So if it's a different title and they have to create their own new title, they're going to have to have a tournament. They're going to have to do something to crown a winner and a brand new champion. And they might have to do that at SummerSlam. And I think there's only one guy that can be SmackDown's first ever WWE champion. And that guy is, of course... You all know his name, John Cena, who did a hell of a job, by the way, hosting the ESPY Awards. I know people hate John Cena, but damn, I was proud of him. Just to see another wrestler making it so big. Brock goes to the UFC and dominates, provided uh, that he didn't take any steroids, that is. And then John Cena is on the ESPYs, hosting such a big show, surrounded by all those athletes, and so many outside eyes are on him. Great publicity and great job. Everybody seemed to like it, and I enjoyed it as well. So kudos to John Cena for pulling that off. So I think he should definitely be the first or second pick going over to SmackDown. And since he's right in the middle of his feud with AJ Styles, I think AJ should go to SmackDown as well. I think the club should come with them. I don't know if they would really want to split the club up when they've just formed them and with other guys potentially coming up to the main roster like Finn Balor. I think the club needs to stay together for now, and Balor is one of the NXT guys that I can see going to SmackDown. Apparently, there's going to be six names drafted to Raw and SmackDown. Now, as far as who those six names are, I don't know really, because I think the obvious ones are Finn Balor. He's way overdue. Also, Bailey. We know that she's due to come up at any time, and I think that tag team, American Alpha, is another good possibility. But as far as everyone else goes, I mean, do you draft Samoa Joe? He's the NXT champion. Maybe you draft Joe now and he drops it to knock Nakamura at the next NXT TakeOver show, but uh, what about uh, Nakamura himself? Daniel Bryan is like Nakamura's biggest mark out there. He's Daniel Bryan's favorite wrestler. Wouldn't Daniel Bryan want to draft him to SmackDown? So it could be Nakamura, but I thought he was in line to win the NXT title. So potentially you could have guys doing some double duty here if WWE decides to draft either Joe or Nakamura or both. And I know he just got there, but Bobby Roode would be another guy that I would like to see come up and get drafted to the main roster, but I don't think they're going to do that. I think he has to spend some time in NXT first before he comes in. 
I love Asuka, but she's the women's champion over there right now, so I don't see them drafting her when she's the title holder, and uh, possibly Nia Jax, like I said, but who knows. So I'm really not that sure who they're going to bring up from NXT other than those four names. I guess it could be anybody, and we'll have to wait and see. Other guys that I see going over to SmackDown is Kevin Owens, because I think Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon have great chemistry, and I would not rule out a match between those two guys someday in the future. So I think having Kevin Owens and Shane on the same show makes for great potential backstage segments and interviews and shit like that. I think Dolph Ziggler should go to SmackDown. I think Rusev should take the United States title to SmackDown. I think Neville, when he gets healthy, should also go to SmackDown. And I mentioned the Brothers of Destruction earlier on, Kane and The Undertaker staying on Raw, so we have to have a couple of other guys that are basically part-timers going to SmackDown, and that is The Rock and Brock. I think both Brock Lesnar and The Rock... Is The Rock eligible, by the way? I don't even know. Maybe he's not. But I think uh, The Rock, since the show is basically named after his catchphrase, should definitely be drafted to SmackDown, and I think he should even appear tomorrow night during the draft. It would be so nice of Rocky if he could figure something out with the schedule and be there for that big night on SmackDown, since he's kind of the father of SmackDown. You know what I mean? So it's highly doubtful that he will be there, but I think it would be really cool if he showed up. So that's kind of where I see the majority of the people going. I know I didn't mention any NXT talent going to Monday Night Raw. I think it's very possible that Finn Balor could be on Monday Night Raw, especially if The Undertaker is going to go there. I think that could be a great potential match for the future. I think my instinct was to put him on SmackDown because of his potential association with the club. But Raw would be a pretty good place for him to go to as well because you have Bray Wyatt over there. That could be another very interesting feud sometime in the future, Bray Wyatt versus Finn Balor. So there's a big part of me that wants to stick Balor on Raw, but for right now, I kind of see him on SmackDown. And I know there's a lot of guys I'm leaving out, so forgive me, but like I said, I don't care where the vaude villains go. I sure as shit don't care where the Ascension goes. If it was up to me, they would go to TNA. And I couldn't care less where Becky lands or Paige or anybody like that. I really don't care. So that's just more, mostly the big names and where I think they will go. Let me know if you agree or disagree with that. I will catch you guys tomorrow night. Don't forget to live tweet me during SmackDown and during the WWE Draft. And a couple hours after the show, I will have a complete review and reaction video up giving my thoughts on the WWE Draft, and I will predict Battleground as well. So you guys have a great rest of your night, and I will catch you tomorrow night. Until then, peace.